<clears throat> that second verse uh, Charles Wesley wrote, um, how did that second verse start? <laughs> To serve the present age, my calling to fulfill. That's always a challenge to me when I think about those words, that my calling is to serve the present age. And um, <clears throat> this morning I'd like to think about the subject of servanthood. And the title that I gave this is uh, A Profile of a Good and Faithful Servant. Now uh, the word profile has different meanings today. When you say profile, everybody thinks about their social media profile, right? That's what it's come to mean. But a profile is really, uh, one of the definitions is an outline or a sketch of something, and that's kind of what I'd like to look at. Uh, Jesus talks about a good and faithful servant in Matthew 25, but I was kind of surprised at how many negative pictures of servants he gave in the New Testament. Can you think of some? Servants who beat each other, servants who hid their talents, Servants who quarreled, Ser servants, it's just amazing, just the list is pretty long of, of uh, not so good servants. And Jesus says in Matthew 25, he talks about the good and faithful servant, and I'd like to just think a little bit about what that profile, what that picture is, because, you know, servanthood is something that um, we, we all serve in some capacity, right? You work at the cafe, you're serving people, you're serving food. But what kind of servant is Jesus talking about in Matthew 25, this good and faithful servant? Let's turn to that passage and read those verses in Matthew 25, uh, verse 14. <clears throat> I'm going to try to hope my voice lasts through this. It's not been the greatest. So I may not read all of this. I don't know. Let's see. Matthew 25, 14. <clears throat> For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And he gave, and to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. So you see they're not necessarily all given the same amount of things. They're given different, different talents, whatever those talents are, whether that's money or actually physical talents. Um, probably here it was money. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise he also who had received two gained two more also. But he also, but he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time the Lord of these, those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Did you notice this morning when Andy was talking about Joseph, at the end he used the word faithful to describe Joseph. He was just faithful in everything he did. Right? And so maybe you think, well, I'm not a Joseph, like I don't I don't have all this responsibility. Well, remember, some of, these, some of these servants only had two talents. Some of them only had one. And what's the commendation to all of them who just use the talents they have? It's, they were commended for their faithfulness. Uh, let's keep reading. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you have delivered to me two talents. Look, I have made... I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there, is, there you have what is yours. So there we have one of the negative examples of, uh, of a servant that Jesus um, says we shouldn't be like him. <clears throat> it's interesting, uh, Dale Heisey has mentioned this a number of times, that the word leadership is not in our Bibles, but the word servanthood is, or servant is. And if you think about um, how a lot of the, the apostles wrote, uh, when they opened their letters, Paul a what? A servant of Jesus Christ. Peter, a servant of Jesus Christ. 
James, a servant of Jesus Christ. That's how they identified themselves. They identified themselves as servants. It wasn't Pastor Paul, um, Dr. Paul, right? Like these titles, they didn't want those titles, I don't think. They were servants. And there is a difference. Now, servants, of course, um, there's probably overlapping um, leadership responsibilities with depending what kind of servant you are. But they didn't think of themselves as as much as leaders as they were just servants to the, to the body of Christ. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, Jesus said in Matthew 23, don't be called teachers, don't be, want, don't, uh, be called rabbi. And it's interesting that right after he says that, he says, he who is greatest among you shall be your, what? Servant. Your servant. And whoever exalts himself shall, will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. All right, so let's think of some profiles of maybe less than true servants. Jesus gave lots of pictures of those. And, and I think about sometimes, you know, there's, there's lots of servants in the world today, people who are contributing greatly to society. Uh, billionaires like Bill Gates have contributed millions of dollars to society. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think it falls short of this profile of a good and faithful servant that Jesus gives. And what is missing? We'll look at that maybe here shortly. <clears throat> uh, all of us in our jobs, and in, in to a certain um, to a certain degree, we're we're really servants to society. Whether you're cooking food or building sheds or cat, whatever you're doing, like you're you're a servant to society, and we need to be that as people of God. We should look at our jobs as ways to serve our communities, but that is not the uh, the ultimate form of servanthood. That's just the means to an end. That's, that of itself is not, um, doesn't make us a good and faithful servant. <clears throat> and, and then we think about uh, different personalities, right? So some of us uh, are maybe kind of introverts, we're kind of shy, and we don't, maybe don't reach out to other people as much as we should, and other people are, are more uh, extroverts, they're, they're outgoing, they love people and all of that. But but with whichever side of that you're on doesn't make you necessarily a good and faithful servant. Like there's still something that's needed on both sides of those personalities. Both of those personalities need something that um, doesn't come naturally to us no matter what our personalities are. <clears throat> so what is the profile of a true servant? The first point that I have, and I'm going to have three of them, is that a good and faithful servant will continually seek to be emptied of self. And I think that uh, last Sunday's sermon, um, Brother Brian, he talked about self a lot. He was talking about emptying ourselves of self and all that. And, and I'm not going to make a lot of comments on that, but just go back and listen to that again. Very, very good sermon about how self um, is, when we're self-centered, it really does keep us from being that good and faithful servant. So I think it's, it's the thing that whether uh, you're an introverted person or you're an extrovert, no matter what your personality is, like even an outgoing person has to deal with self, right? It's not just the introverted person. So, so um, that is the thing that, uh, well, a person that's, uh, that's very introverted, he, he's, his circle is quite small, his comfort level is small. He's bashful, he's timid, he's shy, and he tends to revert to his little circle. He doesn't want to get out of his comfort zone and bless other people. But the same thing can be true with an outgoing person. I think the only difference is that, that a person, a personality like that, maybe just has a little broader circle, maybe a little bigger circle, but it still has a boundary. It has a boundary where it, uh, it's, it's the comfort zone where, where he doesn't want to step out of that and bless people who may think different than he does or do things different than he does or, or just he just doesn't connect well with them. So the, the profile of a true servant is that he will be emptied of himself to the point that he will be willing to bless anyone at the, uh, at the point where, where he can do that, where he can see a need and, and, and not be judgmental of other people. So um, the Good Samaritan would be an example of that, I believe, where, and I think Jesus purposely used that illustration of a Samaritan uh, helping this other man in the ditch because you know the Samaritans were looked down people, looked down on in society. <clears throat> Jesus also said that he came not to be ministered to, but to but to minister. The word minister and the word serve 
are synonymous. When you read the word minister in the Bible, I don't know if, if uh, I know the King James Version uses that word quite a bit to minister. And growing up, we called uh, the preachers ministers, right? Probably most of you did, right? And I think it maybe meant a little something. We thought of it differently maybe than what the word actually means. A minister is just the word servant. So deacon comes from the word uh, diakonos, I think, and minister comes from, is also translated from that same word. There's a couple different words that are translated servant, slave, minister, deacon, and they all are pretty much synonymous. Like they have to do with serving. And so while in the church, sometimes we do ordain and we do call people to, f to fill certain offices or, or spots where service is needed, we all, I want us all to think this morning about how we all can be a, a servant wherever we are. Because uh, it, the Bible says there's differences of administrations. That doesn't mean administrations over churches. It means ministries. There's different types of ministries. And so whether you're young, you're uh, 5, 10 years old here, or whether you're 40 or 50, there's, there is an administration or a ministry for you somewhere, to, either to your parents or to the church or to the community. And I just want to encourage us to look for those opportunities. <clears throat> Now, we, we all do have a need to be served, even though Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. People served him, right? People served him food. They gave him a place to, to sleep and eat, you know, and we do need to be served, but it's not our primary focus. Like, that's not what we're here for. We're not here just to have a blast with our friends. We're here to, to actually seek the good of other people. And Jesus is such a good example of that. <clears throat> So many will serve as long as it makes them feel good in some way, but the true servant goes beyond this because his service is for his master and not for himself. And that leads us to the next point. So the first point was that he's, he seeks to be emptied of himself. I think every good and faithful servant, you'll, you'll see that characteristic, that he will do things that self wouldn't do. Like he'll, he'll crucify self and he will go beyond that to help others. And the second point is that a good and faithful servant remembers he has a master, and he's loyal to him no matter what. No matter through the thick and thin, he's going to be loyal to his master. Who is our master today? Who, who are we servants of? A servant of Jesus Christ, right? That's who the apostles said they were servants of. So it means they didn't get to make up their own agendas, what they're going to serve and, and how they're going to serve it. Um, they were servants to a master. So... If you work in a restaurant or you work at the cafe, cafe right, so the, the servers, the, the waiters, they don't cook the food, they don't make the food, but they, they bless the people that come with the food. Now, maybe at the cafe you help make the food, I don't know. But in a, I think in most restaurants, the waiters, maybe they don't cook the food, is that right? <laughs> they just serve people, right? And, and so if somebody comments to them or yeah, compliments them about the good food, right, like, like, it doesn't really go to the waiter. He's just there to, like, make you comfortable, give you everything you need, and, and make you enjoy your meal, right? And that's, that's what a servant does. He has a master over him that gets the glory, and that we must remember that in life, that, that God is our master, Christ is our master. He has served us, now we are to serve other people. We're to, we're to be his hands and feet. And when we do this, it's to bring glory to him and not to ourselves. <clears throat> The other kind of a server is, is maybe a doctor. And, a, and with a doctor, he's going to serve you. Well, maybe, maybe that comes under another point. The next point is that a good and faithful servant wants nothing but the best for those he serves. So, again, you can take this restaurant example, right? Like you, you're trying to make everybody happy. You want people to enjoy their food. And if something isn't right, you want to make it right for them. You want only what's best for them. Now, here's where there's another illustration that I think also comes into the picture. It's the picture of a doctor. If you go to the doctor and say, I have this pain in my leg or whatever it is, you go there and the doctor says, oh, yeah, I can put a bandage on that. I'll give you some Tylenol and I'll send you home. When there's something wrong in there that should be addressed, would he be a good and faithful doctor just to send you home with Tylenol? Would you be okay with that? No. No. Like, you want the problem addressed, right? And so when the doctor says, you know, you've, like, with Kyle, like, they had to tell us there's cancer there. We're going to have to operate. We're going to have to take that leg off, right? And so 
Why did they say that? It's because they enjoy cutting people's legs off? No. It's because they want the, the best for that person. And they know that sometimes the best for a person means, means doing, like, like actually serving them something that they may not particularly enjoy or want. <clears throat> so <clears throat> an example of a servant who just serves somebody something they want is like, you know how grandparents maybe or, or older people like to give children candy, right? They know that every child likes candy, right? Just serve them candy and you'll be, you'll be happy, they'll be happy. But as parents, we know there's a little more to child training than just serving candy, right? Sometimes you have to have some difficult conversations and discipline, right? So that's all because we know what's best for the child. And grandma's paddle is soft, right? You know, grandma doesn't care. <laughs> she just wants the child to be happy. And as parents, we know that there's a little more um, needed sometimes for the best of the child. <clears throat> and that's not to say that grandma's paddle shouldn't be soft. <laughs> I think that's okay. <clears throat> So then the question comes, if, if, uh, if we're serving what's best for others, what are we supposed to be serving? Right? Like I could go on the street and serve cotton candy all day, right? and I could be a servant, but that's not what Jesus is calling a good and faithful servant. I think we need to, like the waiter, serve to others what has been served to us. I think there's two things that have been served to us, and probably we could include more things, but there's two things that maybe kind of... Um, encompass everything, and I'd like to turn to John 1 for that, and you can see the two things that our, our Master has served to us, and I believe that we are to serve to others. <clears throat> so, Gospel of John, chapter 1. And verse 14. <clears throat> The Word became flesh, as is talking about Christ, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the, be the only begotten of the Father, full of what two things? Grace, Grace and truth. All right, so it's, immediate, uh, it's recently just been really impressed in my mind how these two things together form like a super powerful form of service. One without the other doesn't work. Um, let me just define here a little bit what I mean by grace and truth. And I think it maybe can be best illustrated with a story. And I'm going to give you two stories, and you probably heard these stories if you've listened to uh, Merle Burkholder. I may listen to Merle Burkholder's stories. Okay, a few. <clears throat> this was on um, one of the recent uh, Anab Anabaptist Perspective episodes. He gave some stories. So uh, Merle's kind of known for his storytelling. So he gives us one story. I'm going to try to just say it the best I can, but I didn't write it down. He was a young boy working for someone, um, and I, if I understand right, they had a tractor that had a broken steering wheel. Anybody know this story? Okay, so it had a broken steering wheel or something. Something was broken on it. The steering didn't always work quite right. So he was operating this tractor, and uh, he, had, uh, he had a few times told the, oper the operator in the, in the shop that there's an issue with this steering, can you please fix this? And it just wasn't getting done. And so this one time he was operating this tractor, it might have been a loader, I don't know what it was. And, and uh, anyway, the steering acted up and they had, I think it had this like, this knuckle on the steering wheel, if you know what I mean, where you grab it and turn the wheel. And, and the steering wheel flew around and it hit him in the arm and it hurt him pretty bad. And it, and it sent him into a, a temper tantrum. And so he went into the, into the shop to the manager and just gave him a piece of his mind about why this thing should be fixed and why, why hasn't it been fixed and, and all this. You know, he's not going to ever run this thing again until it's fixed. <clears throat> now, this, this, uh, while he was doing all of this, at the same time, <laughs> Uh, somebody else had just entered the door, entered the room that he wasn't aware of, and it was a, an older man, I think, that kind of took an interest in him, someone that came into the shop periodically, that kind of took an interest in Merle, and this older man overheard this conversation, and as Merle went out, this man took Merle, and he took him up to the wall, and, and in Merle's description, 
pinned him to the wall and just gave, gave him a piece of his mind. Not exactly, but this is what he said. He's like, like listen, like if you're ever going to get anywhere in life, you're going to have to learn how to deal with this kind of situation when something doesn't go your way and something isn't done the way you think. You're going to have to learn how to respond differently. What I need you to do is go back to that manager and apologize. And you're going to tell him that you're going to drive that tractor as long as you need to. And if he ever gets it fixed, you'll say thank you. Now, that would take a little bit of humility to do that, wouldn't it? <laughs> After just being in there and giving him a piece of his mind. All right, so <clears throat> the story goes on that this man took him by the arm. They went together. He apologized and told him all this. He's going to drive this tractor as long as he, you know, as long as he uh, is asked to. And if it ever gets fixed, he'll say thank you. The man took him back out and bought him a Mountain Dew. Now, here's what this story illustrates. I think it illustrates grace and truth and the combination of the two. Um, what was the grace, maybe I should say, what was the truth part of it? The truth part was that this man took him, and tomorrow it felt like he was being pinned against the wall. Probably wasn't that way. This man took him there and just said, listen, you need to respond differently. He was telling him a truth, something that needed to change in his life. What was the grace part? Maybe you can tell me. What? That was part of it. Yeah, definitely. But he took him by the arm and went with him. So grace, Titus 2.11 says that grace teaches us. Right? Grace isn't just being merciful to someone. Grace isn't just like overlooking the truth about something. Oh, I'm going to be gracious. I'm not going to speak truth. No, grace teaches. So grace and truth together did something for Merle that, like, think about it. If that man wouldn't have done that, if the man would have said, I'm just going to be gracious the way we use the word gracious, I'm not going to say anything, I'm going to hope it, you know, he learns, his, he learns how to respond well. Maybe Merle would have, but something powerful came out of that. Um, and so he, he went, grace comes alongside someone. Now, think about grace that way. It's graciousness is more than just mercy, it's more than just forgiveness, but it's about empowering somebody. So if you need to speak difficult truth to someone, be willing to do that, but also be willing to come alongside that person and say, Let's do this. I'm here. I've got your back. I'm going to help you. You can do this. And interestingly, the other story, I think Merle gave this in that same episode, was Merle did the same thing for somebody else later in life. And, and you have to listen to the story. There's, there's, it probably wouldn't work to do this with, with everybody quite in that situation, except that Merle knew this man very well. So he had a, a young man, a friend of his, that left his wife. And, this, and he left his wife, and this man went off and lived by himself and got a job at a grocery store. I mean, it was a Walmart, and that was a grocery store, some, some for grocery store. Anyway, Merle was, was pretty burdened about this, and Merle decided he's going to go to this grocery store and, and try to, to talk to this man, or to look him up. So he did. He went, found the man stocking shelves, <clears throat> and he went up to him, and he said, listen, like, what you did isn't right. Like, like you need to go back to your wife. Like, let's go. I, I'm going to go with you. And at first the man was like, no, like I, I just got my job. You know, I, I'm only working here two weeks. I just got a job, and now uh, I'm going to, I want to keep, keep working here. Merle's like, how did you get a job here? Well, like I, I talked to the manager, and we, you know, he hired me. He said, what we're going to do, we're going to go back to that manager. We're going to go back there and say, we're quitting this job. I got to go back to my wife. <laughs> and... And he did. They went together. They went to the manager. He, he left his job, and he went back to his wife. Merle was being, maybe we should say, a little persistent. But I think he knew this person well enough that he knew what it took. But he was being honest with him. He was giving him truth. But he was also being gracious as he was coming alongside him. He said, let's go. He went with him to the office. He went with him to talk to his manager. And he helped him through this situation. As far as I understand, was, that couple is still together today. I just think it's a, it's a powerful picture to see these two things work together. And, I, and if I think about if, if someone is just truthful, I don't know if the situation would have changed. And if the person is just gracious, I don't know if the situation would have changed. So, you know, I, as we think about these two things, probably all of us can think about our own personalities. Some of us tend to shy away from being too truthful. Some of us tend to shy away from being too gracious, you know? And, and what's the right balance? Well, I would suggest that maybe the two together 
in their proper proportion is what it takes to, um, is, is, is a very powerful force. Anyway, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. <clears throat> so think about grace. Think about these two stories and think about grace. Grace does contain mercy, but it's more than that. Grace comes alongside the other and coaches and teaches like Titus 2.11 says. It teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should be, I oh, forget the words. Grace doesn't ignore truth. It takes the other by the arm and then buys them a Mountain Dew. The truth part. Sometimes truth is the hard facts about ourselves that we often tend to be blind to. Truth exposes error and shows us where we're off track. Just like the doctor, you know, he, he might tell us some hard things and it can be painful. So truth does have both positive and negative elements. But we need both. And think about Jesus and the letters to the churches in Revelation. Was it all positive? Was it all negative? No, like there was both. Like he, he gave a truthful picture of where they were at. And I think, uh, of course, in the grace of God and the Holy Spirit, he was right there ready to walk them through whatever repentance needed to happen. <clears throat> truth by itself is less likely to change anyone without adding grace. And truth can only be received with humility. And I think about that story of Merle. I, I took a tremendous amount of humility to go back to that manager. But with humility comes grace. Remember Jesus said that um, grace, was it Jesus, I forget. In the New Testament it says that grace comes to the humble. Why do the humble receive grace? Because in humility they accept the truth. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Right, so there's freedom in accepting the truth in our lives. The question is, do I want the truth? Jesus is our perfect example of this. He spoke the truth when needed, but he also ate and dined with sinners. He was there with them. He was ready to, to minister to anyone that came into his path. All right, then in conclusion, I'd like to think about how to make this practical in our own lives. And I want to look at uh, Jesus' example again. Now I have a question for you. How many years did Jesus serve in ministry? Three, okay. Anybody have any other answers? This is kind of a trick question, okay? So it's not as easy as that. Okay, so here's, <clears throat> here's why I'm calling it a trick question. I said, how many years did Jesus serve in ministry, not public ministry? When you say, how many years did Jesus serve in ministry, it, what do you think now? Since he was 12. What? Since he was 12. Yeah, probably since he was 12. And maybe even longer than that, right? Like, as soon as he was helping wash the dishes. right? Maybe as soon as six or seven, right? That's, that's ministry. See, we think ministry is the last three years. It's the public thing. And that's the public ministry, yes. But, see, I want us to think about ministry as starting wherever you are right now, except maybe the babies. You know, the babies, they, I don't know if they can serve, but most of us here this morning have a capacity to serve someone. When did Jesus start his uh, public ministry? At what age, approximately? This is not a trick question. 30. About 30 years old. How many here are under 30 years old? Raise your hand. Okay, most of us are under, most of you are under 30 years old. So, see, we, we like the public ministry. We want to we look out and do all this stuff out here. But what we forget is it was 29 or 30 years of ministry preparing him for that last public ministry. And if we don't get that right, the public ministry wouldn't go right either, right? So, um, you know, when Jesus was 12 years old, he went and um, he happened to be in the temple there and he was ministering to the people there. And, and you know, like... He could have almost felt like, yeah, like I, I'm ready for public ministry. Like I'm, I have answers to these for these people. I know how to debate with the teachers here and the, and the rabbis. Like I, it's time for public ministry. But no, it wasn't time yet. He went back home. It says and was subject to his parents. And what does that mean? He just served his parents. Whatever he worked in the shop, he helped his mom. He helped his brothers and sisters. That's ministry, all right. So if that's where you're at today, um, praise the Lord. Like you're serving. You're doing something. You're serving the Lord God, the Lord Christ. 
even though it, it may not be as public as what um, someday down the road it may be. <clears throat> now think about how long it was from the time that Jesus was 12 years old when, when maybe he thought he's ready for public ministry until he was 30. How many years is that? How many more years did he you could say sit at home, but no, he didn't just sit at home. He served at home. How many more years is that? 18 years. All right, now how long is 18 years? Is anybody here 18 years old? Okay, so we have some 18-year-olds. So think about back when Adam and Aaron were babies and, and you held them in the rocking chair, right? That's, that was 18 years ago. That's from then till now. That's how long Jesus had to wait at home till he was ready for public ministry. Um, I don't know if there's something to learn from that or not. Moses is another example of that. I think he felt ready for public ministry when he was back in Egypt and he killed that. He killed that Egyptian. You know, he, he was ready to take the bull by the horns and lead Israel out, but he wasn't ready. He had to go to the wilderness for how many more years? Tending sheep. Was it 40 years? 40, 40 more years, right? So he was, I think, 40 in Egypt, 40 more years. He was 80 years old when God finally was ready to use him, right? Is there anything to learn from that? I, I don't know. I just think maybe sometimes we, we tend to look out too much. We want, we want to do all the fancy, daz, dazzling, um, showy service things. And, and that's okay, like keep your vision out there, but remember that we need to learn how to serve each other. Serve your brothers and sisters, serve your mothers, because, you know, when, when you come, you, you younger ones here, when you come to the age of finding a wife or a husband, you know what you should look for? You should look for a, a woman, boys, look for a woman who has learned how to serve her brothers and sisters. And if she doesn't know how to do that, don't think she's going to serve you well either. And girls, it's the same way. Like if you want a husband that's going to serve you well, think about a man who has learned to wash the dishes, help clean the house, help his brothers and sisters. Right? That's a mark of character. That's a mark of um, someone who has learned servanthood. Those are characteristics that will also be... Um, They'll be there when, when, when you're ready for marriage. All right, I don't know why, where I'm going with all this, but anyway, in conclusion, <clears throat> I was going to talk about making this practical. Serving our parents and our family. Serve, serve, serve wherever you are. If you're a young child right now, help at home, help your brothers and sisters. Uh, make it enjoyable for your brothers and sisters. Think about them as your best friends, right? <clears throat> Some of us are older, some of us are parents. We have children to serve. We have, you know, we have, um, yeah, how do, how do we serve as parents with this grace and truth model? Like I think here we can think about how to serve our children with truth and then also come along beside them. Like it's the same, the same principles there can be applied. When we think about our children, they need discipline, they need teaching but we come alongside them, we help them, we, we want to walk them through this journey of life. There's, um, there's this model of parenting that I don't know much about, I've only heard about it some, called the gentle parenting method. And, and if I understand this right, that to its fullest uh, extent, whatever, this model of gentle parenting says, it puts all the responsibility to the child. Instead of speaking truth to the child and expecting obedience, it tries to get them to analyze the situation and then make a decision and hopefully try to influence them. So for example, instead of telling a child to tie his shoe because it, he could trip and fall, right? it asks the child, don't you think you should tie your shoe? But it leaves the decision to the child. And while not all of that is bad, I think there is something wrong with, uh, with this model, and that is that, that parents do need to give truth, they need to give direction, and they need to expect obedience. But then, then the grace part is we come alongside. We do this gently. I'm not against gentle parenting. I'm against uh, maybe some of that model that's being presented in some places. Abraham is said to have commanded his children after him, and God blessed him for that. He commanded. Now, that's not 
demanding. Demanding is not commanding. Commanding says, here's the truth, here's the way, walk in it, and let's do this together. Eli is an example of someone who didn't use truth and grace correctly. He said to his sons, don't do this, don't do this, but that's where it stopped. He didn't come alongside and say, we're going to stop this and we're going to do this together. <clears throat> so serve, that's a serving as parents in the church, be servants in the church. I, I wrote this down that we should try to be each other's best friends in the church. And you know, sometimes that takes a little work, especially after time and we get to know each other. You know, we know all of our shortcomings and all that. But here's something I think to serve each other, to bless each other. Let's try to be each other's best friends. You know, there's things we can do in marriage and in the church to do that. Like it's the first works, the works of love toward each other. And we talk about, um, um, lost my train of thought. And now thinking about serving in our community, serving our neighbors. How do we serve them with grace and truth? Um, doesn't mean we go out and preach hellfire and whatever to them, but it does mean that in our interactions with them, we're always going to be truthful. So if you're selling sheds, right, you're truthful, you're honest, you're telling people what they're getting. And if something doesn't fit their needs, we're going to be honest and tell them that, right? So we're truthful, we're honest, and then we're also there to walk alongside them in purchasing, whatever. So our jobs can be a way of serving our communities. That's one way. And then, of course, we look for needs. We look for ways to help uh, disaster areas and those kind of things. There's, there's so much service we can do in our communities. And then don't forget to serve Jesus, your master. And I was impressed by the story of Mary. Uh, I think it was Mary, the one who broke that little uh, bottle of spikenard. And the disciples saw it, and they said, what's the waste with this? Like, this could have been sold and given to the poor but she was just serving her master. She was showing some dedication and love to him. So in all of our service, don't forget, spend time with your master and, and show him your love and service. <clears throat> so wherever we are in life, there is opportunities to serve. And we can sometimes just sit around and say, I don't know how to serve, I don't know where to serve. I like this saying, when there's a fork in the road, take it, right? So. There are opportunities right in front of you. Don't sit in indecision. There are things you can do. Just take it, right? There's, whether you take the left or the right sometimes doesn't matter. So in conclusion, what is the profile of a good and faithful servant? Number one, we said he's emptied of self. That, that is an absolute requirement to, to be a true and faithful servant. He's loyal to his master. And three, he wants nothing but the best for those he serves. And if we have, and you can probably add to this list, these are just three that I thought of. If we can cultivate this in our lives and take the fork when it comes, I think that God will bless us like he did Joseph in the story that we read here. The church in the world is dying for a lack of true servants. And the world is tending away from service. We have self-service, self-checkout, self-this, self-that. In the body of Christ, we are to preserve the spirit of Love by serving one another. And that's my challenge to us today. God bless you all.